So, dear colleagues, it's time to start. It will be a small change in the schedule. Уважаемые коллеги, у нас сейчас запланировано некоторое, вре... некоторое изменение в программе. Сначала у нас сейчас выступит хирург, профессор Бордин, сделает доклад на тему лечения кровотечения верхних отделов желудочно-кишечного тракта. Good afternoon, dear chair, dear colleagues. Thank you very much for inviting me as the first speaker, being a surgeon. I have to leave you soon because I have to join another meeting in a short time. I would like to analyze the current status with GI bleeding of ulcerative origin in Moscow and the approaches of Moscow specialists to treat this complicated problem. Uh, it is of no doubt that uh, the significance and high prevalence of GI bleedings, including ulcerative of ulcerative origin, origin with high rate of uh, recurrence despite all the attempts to stop the bleeding and high mortality rates draw the attention of the specialists, not only in Russia but all over the world, too. This is the recent data demonstrated in Moscow, and as we can see here, the urgent conditions related to peptic ulcers and GI ulcers are number four in the structure of uh, morbidity and in back in 2017 uh, the number of patients not only decreased but it was increased and uh, these statistics is based on the official statement of the Ministry of Health in our practical in our everyday practice, we use uh, the clinical guidelines that are based on the national and international multicenter clinical trials. Also, uh, Russian and national guidelines have been adopted in 2014. Taking into account uh, specifics of Moscow, with a huge population and the equipment of the hospitals. In 2017, a decree was issued with one section dedicated to ulcer uh, peptic ulcers complicated with uh, GI bleedings. And treatment of peptic ulcers is a complex uh, problem that can only be solved by the efforts of multidisciplinary uh, teams. Uh, PPI is uh, usually prescribed to the patients as well as statins and other drugs and in hospitals uh, a multidisciplinary uh, team is uh, formed uh, contain that contains gastroenterologists surgeons and intensivists and the whole uh, treatment regimen including medical treatment um, endoscopy as well as surgery can be accomplished our main goal when we see a patient with uh, gas, GI bleeding, esophagogastroduodenoscopy of an urgent manner should be done based on forest bleeding classification. And this patient should log logistically be assigned uh, to some uh, center where uh, 
the endoscopy will be performed. If it is an urgent patient, uh, it is uh, an intensive care unit. If it is a more stable patient, it also he, he or she also requires endoscopy. And this is a very important uh, prerequisite uh, that should be done under medical sedation. As we find ourselves with, uh, ourselves with the source of bleeding, hemostasis should be done. Our preferences are multi-component or two-component hemostasis. In the Botkins Hospital, we combine in injectable uh, agents uh, in case of Forest One, or in injections with clipping, or if this is Forest Two. 2A, 2B ulcers, uh, when clipping is impossible with a big surface of bleeding, then this is a combination of hemostasis with argon plasma uh, coagulation. This is the number of endoscopic hemostasis distributed through the recent years. We see it is closer to 6,000 uh, cases of successful hemostasis. Uh, primary endoscopic hemostasis is effective in nearly 80% of cases, and by 2018, in Moscow hospitals, uh, these statistics was reached. Even uh, sometimes uh, it is higher, up to 92%. Repeated hemostasis in, in case of a recurrent uh, bleeding uh, is, has a lower efficacy, is about 70 percent. The causes of uh, failure of hemostasis, uh, these causes were analyzed based on the uh, surveillance and questionnaires. And one of the reasons for uh, failures that we analyzed in took into account that intravenous sedation is an important prerequisite. Uh, this enables uh, a parallel conservative treatment. And also one single component hemostasis was used even in case of Forest 1A and Forest 1B in case of a visible uh, bleeding vessel. The third cause of failure of endoscopic hemostasis was underestimation of the ulcer itself, which later on results in uh, bleeding the recurrence. Especially it is true for the posterior ulcers when a gastroduodenal or pancreatoduodenal arteries are involved. Also ulcers on the lesser curvature with possible involvement of gastric arteries. That is, uh, intensive hemostasis uh, should be based on good cooperation between the surgeon and the endoscopist. If you succeed with endoscopic uh, hemostasis, you need to prepare the patient for a future uh, surgery and should not limit yourself with endoscopic hemostasis only. And in a number of cases, there was a whole combination of uh, reasons for failure. Uh, as you succeeded with hemostasis, later on the patient should be referred to the respective specialists. And in case of relapse is sus suspected, we can uh, repeat uh, endoscopic hemostasis. But next comes the question, uh, what uh, the patient should do then, later. Our leading endovascular surgeon from Botkin Hospital will uh, refer, will address this issue. The question is whether to start with extended open surgery or continue with endovascular interventions. And by our national guidelines uh, and by international guidelines, uh, the indications for endovascular uh, interference uh, is uh, when the opportunities of hemostasis are not adequate. This is our algorithm.
uh, in relapses uh, of uh, GI uh, hemorrhage uh, if it is a severe patient with a heavy comorbid uh, uh, background, if there is a relapse of hemorrhage uh, during the secondary endoscopic hemostasis, uh, then we uh, need uh, to involve uh, X-ray and the vascular uh, surgeons. If there are no co uh, severe comorbidities, if the profusion hemorrhage uh, continues and there is no time for endovascular uh, interference uh, or there are no conditions, then uh, there is uh, no other way as uh, the surgical interference. Uh, Thus, indications for surgery are non-effective endoscopic hemostasis with the continuing hemorrhage, uh, impossibility to make uh, endovascular interference, and uh, in the uh, primary uh, hemostasis, a higher risk of hemorrhage uh, in the near future. The surgery of choice uh, is not a patient where we are supposed to show all the opportunities of the large surgery to make a resection, a constructive interference. It should be a mini uh, surgery, gastro or duodenotomy, uh, with uh, uh, suturing uh, the bleeding vessel. If it is the ulcer of a duodenal uh, area, if uh, there is uh, a stenosis, stenosis, probably some uh, drainage is possible or pyloroplastics. Uh, well, but the, you know, in case of large uh, ulcers uh, plus uh, stenosis, uh, uh, the, and we need a salvage uh, uh, surgery, probably resection uh, interferences are possible, but this, this should be an exception uh, of the rule. And in our clinic, when we discuss uh, resection, we always uh, have a, a concilium, and the uh, surgery is made by the most experienced surgeons. The algorithm of, uh, of the therapy uh, in our Botkin Hospital is shown on the slide. So if it is also uh, bleeding, the in endoscopists uh, stop it, then the assessment is made, the depth of the ulcer is uh, measured by the surgeon. If bleeding continues, then the uh, patient is operating on. If we stop uh, uh, bleeding or if there is a relapse, uh, then we use endovascular interference. If they are not effective, then uh, an, an urgent operation is to be made. These are the uh, dynamics of the data, types of operative uh, or su surgical interventions. We see that the number of resection operations is, uh, has been reducing. If in 2016, uh, resection... Uh, uh, resection interference uh, made up uh, up to 40 percent uh, in 2018. It is only 20 percent for this group of patients, the most severe patients. Uh, so the uh, number of uh, suturing is up to 50 percent, uh, and. Uh, uh, the positive uh, dynamics is shown in the number of endovascular interventions, uh, which amounted uh, to up to 27 uh, percent in 2018. The number of uh, surgeries, uh, the general number, is uh, shown here, and uh, lethality uh, due to this approach, when we have uh, clear indications for this or that type, uh, we have managed to reduce uh, lethality from 2.7 to uh, to from 7.9 to 4.8. As to post-operational lethality, it has been stable, uh, and it amounts to 1.3 percent. Uh, the structure of uh, lethality causes uh, in ulcer uh, bleedings, uh, mainly this is severe comorbidity and elderly age. Uh, 
uh, and that amounts uh, that uh, that makes up 70 percent of the patients. The second place in lethality uh, is uh, um, uh, late uh, referral when uh, uh, patients remain at home for a number of days, and despite all the treatment we offered, uh, the patients died, and up to. Uh, eight percent is uh, the improper tactics uh, of uh, patient management uh, uh, when uh, uh, the procedures were not done on a timely uh, basis, especially endoscopic hemostasis, and the reason uh, of. Uh, uh, unsatisfactory results. So the main reason is when surgeons uh, try to make endoscopic hemostasis uh, for a long time, uh, but they are supposed to stop at one moment of time and send the patients for the surgery. And uh, here you see uh, 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 let me give you a clinical case uh, from one of the Moscow hospitals, a patient, a female patient of 86 years, a very severe patient with comorbidities. Uh, ECGS showed uh, the uh, deep uh, ulcer. Uh, and uh, she uh, uh, endoscopic hemostasis was uh, done. Uh, five uh, years later, there were relapses uh, of uh, the hemorrhaging. Uh, then uh, at the uh, uh, so again. Uh, uh, endoscopic hemostasis was made, and we can understand surgeons because the patient is 86 years, nobody wants to operate, the outcome is uh, very questionable. But uh, five uh, uh, hours later, a repeated uh, hemostasis was made, the patient was sent uh, to the uh, surgery room, and uh, she died on the surgery table. Well, after the first, uh, after the first uh, uh, endoscopic hemostasis, we needed to discuss immediately uh, the surgical treatment. And one more example. It is a combination of several types of hemostasis. Uh, non uh, als uh, um, gastric uh, cancer. Uh, here you see the uh, images. The endoscopic hemostasis was not effective. The patient was immediately sent into the endovascular operation room. Uh, so bleeding from the uh, left uh, uh, gastric artery. Embolization was made on the uh, right uh, image. Now you see control CT, you see the gastric tumor. Uh, it shows thrombus. The uh, bleeding was uh, stopped, and after the, pre uh, pre uh, the correction of anemia, the patient was uh, operated on uh, gastroscopy. Uh, gastroscopy to me was uh, made uh, to the patient. So this is a multi-component uh, uh, and uh, uh, vascular uh, treatment uh, of the patient. Uh, so, and uh, to our mind, uh, surgeons uh, uh, cannot solve the problem of ulcers. The main thing is to prevent uh, uh, bleedings, uh, and the main burden falls on the gastroenterologist. The surgeons can only improve uh, the results uh, uh, of the treatment of the severe disease. Uh, that's why the hospitals that are very well equipped to do hemostasis uh, should be uh, should be. Uh, set up and also uh, plus to open surgery uh, and the vascular um, uh, interventions are to be introduced on a larger basis. We are a little bit behind the schedule already after the first lecture, so I would like to just ask you very quickly, maybe I didn't catch properly, what is the percentage of patient in the Moscow region that after severe ble upper GI bleeding um, goes to the surgery. What is the percentage of patients who are operated on among all the 
patients that uh, uh, that enter the hospital because of the upper GI bleeding? How many percentage of those you operate? Uh, please return the slide. In all the urgent uh, pathology, including uh, acute uh, cholestitis, uh, appendicitis, it's about it's seven percent, seven percent uh, in Moscow. Four thousand ninety people come with bleedings. For twelve million of uh, people, out of them. Uh, surgical uh, open surgical operation is made uh, on 400 people. Two thousand twenty three sutures uh, have been made out of four thousand people. Uh, to eighty seven we made resection of the stomach and one hundred nineteen and the went and the vascular uh, intervention. All the other four thousand uh, patients no three uh, thirty five hundred uh, patients they undergo endoscopic hemostasis. То есть чуть меньше десяти процентов, да? Okay, uh, is it usual that perform uh, urgent urgent upper GI endoscopy and uh, deliver the hemostasis or not? Нет. В России, в России. In Russia, uh, we have a, 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 a narrow specialization endoscopist. In uh, multi-profile uh, hospitals, uh, there is an endoscopist on call who knows all the methods of hemostasis and all methods of endoscopic interventions on lungs, the stomach, on the uh, bile system. Uh, in, in that group of specialists that take care endoscopically uh, or not? Are they always gastroenterologists, or do surgeons also do the yeah. endoscopic hemostasis? У нас есть, да. We have a special. We have three specialists in Russian: gastroenterologist, therapist who goes for conservative therapy, then endoscopic doctor who performs endoscopic interventions and endoscopic diagnostics, and the surgeon who does surgical interventions, laparoscopic or open surgery. Uh, <coughs> Then thank you again. Uh, we should proceed with the presentation of Professor Laszlo Hershenyi from Budapest, Budapest, Hungary, about the endoscopic approach to the patients with upper GI bleeding. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. Thank you, Professor Bordin, uh, for the kind invitation. Uh, our center is one of the biggest centers of uh, upper GI emergency, and I believe that uh, this 10 percent for surgery is too much, uh, at least in our center, uh, not more than, than 3 percent uh, are, uh, are admitted to, to surgery. So almost all uh, major points have been touched by Professor Bedi. In. These are the main key points uh, that I will try to share with you in a few minutes. Uh, so uh, the annual incidence and prevalence of upper GI bleeding is uh, increasing every year, and uh, uh, almost all know that uh, this is the, probably the biggest challenge in uh, emergency gastroenterology. We all know also uh, the etiology, the main causes, peptic ulcer disease, erosive esophagitis, erosive gastritis, duodenitis, mallory White syndrome, uh, lower percentage of upper, GI, uh, of upper GI malignancy, but please also know that uh, up to 25 percent, uh, the exact cause of uh, upper GI bleeding is uh, not identified at the beginning. 
So uh, this is the, the main uh, guideline uh, used in uh, Europe and also in uh, Hungary. And uh, the first uh, point is uh, the initial patient evaluation. Uh, we should uh, start uh, immediately uh, the, the intravascular parenteral volume repla replacement and also uh, to start uh, the transfusion. But uh, it's important to have a restrictive strategy for, uh, for transfusion. Uh, further, uh, we should use a, st uh, a validated risk stratification in order to uh, categorize uh, as uh, high or low risk groups. And uh, um, uh, European guidelines suggest that Glasgow uh, score should be used uh, for endoscopy stratification. As you know, several points uh, have been used, and uh, we should uh, categorize as low risk, uh, low risk patient uh, who requires neither early endoscopy nor hospital admission. So, uh, pre-endoscopy management, uh, the prothrombin level should be uh, ideally uh, less than 2.5 is if the clinical situation allows. We should withdraw uh, virfarin and also direct uh, anticoagulants. Uh, we should correct uh, coagulopathy. We should start immediately uh, high-dose parenteral PPI therapy, but uh, uh, this uh, PPI infusion uh, should not delay the performance of emergency endoscopy. And also in a severe bleeding, uh, we should use uh, parenteral erythromycin. So uh, further, uh, there are some not recommended strategies, such as use of uh, somatostatin or, or erythrotide. Uh, endotracheal intubation should be performed in all uh, severe and polymorphic patients. And uh, this is also a debate regarding uh, the timing, for, uh, timing of uh, acute endoscopy, very early, early or delayed. Uh, the uh, European guidelines suggest early in uh, uh, 20, uh, 24 hours. In our department, we are uh, almost uh, performed uh, upper GI endoscopy in less than uh, six or, or 12 hours. Uh, uh, very early endoscopy should be performed in very risk uh, and high risk uh, patients uh, in the presence of hemodynamic instability or a contraindication of anticoagulation. Uh, we, uh, we also know uh, the forest classification should be, should be used. Uh, Three categories of forest classification is known, but please note uh, the bleeding rate is uh, higher and higher if uh, the endoscopic uh, finding is uh, more, more severe. You can see that uh, in forest uh, 1A and 1B, uh, there is a higher risk, more than a 50% uh, higher risk of uh, bleeding. Uh, this finding should be taken into consideration. So uh, another uh, very important challenge is the use of antiplatelet agents. Uh, usually these are the most uh, important uh, etiologic factors for bleeding. Uh, we should uh, have uh, two scenarios, uh, high risk or low risk uh, patients. So in the presence of high risk, uh, in a primary prophylaxis, uh, we should withdraw uh, aspirin. Uh, if uh, the aspirin used in a secondary prophylaxis, aspirin should be stopped at least for three days. Or if uh, there is a double uh, antiplatelet therapy, um, clopidogrel should be stopped. And uh, in a high-risk patient, aspirin can be, can be continued. If there is a low risk of endoscopic stigmata in primary prophylaxis, we should stop uh, aspirin. Uh, on the other hand, uh, in secondary prophylaxis, uh, uh, we should continue either aspirin or also a double, uh, uh, double antiplatelet uh, therapy. So it's a very important uh, uh, question uh, before endoscopy. So uh, this is the most important algorithm for endoscopic management. We have uh, three scenarios. Uh, patient with high risk uh, of, uh, of bleeding, we should perform uh, endoscopic hemostasis uh, with combining uh, with another modality, and we should continue with uh, medical treatment. In the presence of uh, uh, middle uh, risk, uh, we should uh, remove the clot. Uh, we should perform endoscopic hemostasis 
disease, or we should start immediately parenteral uh, proton pump inhibitor and to continue with other medical uh, treatment. And last but not least, uh, in a low risk patient, probably uh, endoscopic hemostasis is not uh, so important. We should start immediately with uh, medical therapy. So what to do uh, if the, there is a bleeding uh, in, the, in a patient, we should repeat immediately upper GI endoscopy with endoscopic hemostasis. We should consider endoscopic salvage, uh, uh, hemostatic spray or over the scope, or uh, there is a role of radiologist that will be discussed later on, or a surgery that has been touched uh, previously. So in summary, uh, upper GI bleeding is an enormous and the biggest challenge in gastroenterology with significant morbidity and mortality, but uh, with uh, exact organization and logistics in compliance with, uh, uh, with the proper guideline, we should improve the outcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laszlo. Excellent overview. I have just a provocative question. What, what do you mean by the... Um, Thermotherapy. Do you mean the bipolar uh, thermotherapy or do you mean also APC? So uh, APC has been all already mentioned by the surgeon, but uh, usually, at, at least uh, according to the guideline, uh, maybe a mechanical uh, approach is, is better than, than uh, thermal uh, therapy. Any other question? So if not, thank you very much again. And we should proceed with uh, the presentation from uh, uh, Dr. Tsurkan about the role of uh, radiologists uh, in, in upper GI bleeding. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, dear chairperson, good afternoon. My talk is dedicated to uh, uh, huge and important uh, section of diagnostics of patients with upper GI bleeding using uh, methods of radiology. Uh, let me start. Uh, the upper GI bleeding are those that uh, result in the lumen of a GI tract and are, related, are, are located above the Troitzer ligament. If we take at the general distribution, acute GI bleedings are quite prevalent all over the world and uh, are one of the major reasons for hospital admittance with statistic to 40 to 150 per 100,000 population per year ranging in, in different countries. The incidence increase with age. Acute GI bleeding may complicate other conditions in patients who are admitted with other diagnoses. And the mortality is quite high in GI bleedings, especially in uh, recurrent bleedings or in severely comorbid patients or on in septic shock. The arterial conditions like um, ulcerative disease uh, peptic ulcers, erosions of the esophagus and the gaster, uh, up to 20% of patients uh, are comprised of this group. Uh, spontaneously, up to 80% of bleedings may stop on their own, whereas relapse may develop in up to 25% of cases, which increases uh, in-hospital uh, mortality. And this is a very demanding group of patients. Based on the European guidelines on the diagnostics of GI bleedings, the result would depend on endoscopic findings. In patients with high uh, risk of bleeding or with uh, continuing bleeding, endoscopic hemostasis is uh, done. In case of relapsed uh, bleeding, uh, repeated endoscopical interventions can be done with repeated attempts of hemostasis. One of the robust uh, recommendations is that in case of uh, repeated uh, bleedings and in case of failure of uh, previous attempts, either transcatheter embolization or surgical hemostasis are recommended with high level of evidence. What do we have 
currently uh, in our diagnostic armory. One of the most effective method is endoscopy with a uh, very high uh, sensitivity uh, up to 98 or even 100 percent. But patients that are poorly prepared for endoscopy may fail to be diagnosed uh, using endoscopically. I mean the origin of bleeding is somewhere in the upper GI uh, tract. Radionuclide or radionuclear methods are time consuming and are not always applicable in the urgent patients. And spiral CT, the multi-spiral CT is a highly specific diagnostic modality and uh, helps reveal the source of bleeding from uh, 0.5 to 3 ml per minute. And angiography, including endovascular interventions, may help reveal the source of bleeding in many cases. However, it is an invasive method that can be combined with a treatment attempt. Historical overview of interventional uh, radiological methods development. In order to verify the source of bleeding, uh, the studies were started back in 1960s. At first, they wanted to find the cause of bleeding, the origin of bleeding, and later on, these methods were developed uh, to combine these diagnostic options with the treatment. Uh, Joseph Roesch, Charles' daughter, and Michael Brown published uh, their attempts for selective arterial embolization. Actually, this was the first pioneering work uh, to embolize the artery with auto autologous clots. The anatomy of hepatopancreatic duodenal area is presented here. We are interested in uh, two arterial branches of uh, superior mesenteric artery and uh, celiac trunk. This area has two sources of bleeding with very um, developed collaterals, and the result will depend on the primary source of bleeding, either a, a measure uh, branches or uh, peripheral uh, branches, and therefore we can either go for central embolization or uh, peripheric embolization. The indications for X-ray uh, endovascular occlusion, there are no uh, uh, absolute contraindications, whereas the relative contraindications are hemorrhagic shock in combination with a bleeding a need for urgent surgery and uh, allergy to the um, radiopharmaceutical. Uh, X-ray exam can reveal the signs of continuing uh, Bleeding. This is extravasation of the radio pharmaceutical, either in the gastric cavity or intestinal cavity, which are direct signs, whereas indirect signs may be revealed as uh, aneurysm or pseudoaneurysm, uh, tortuous uh, out, uh, contours of the artery, and uh, signal scattering. There are two types of uh, embolization agents. Uh, the first uh, result in temporary occlusion of the vessel, whereas the second one may uh, end up with uh, permanent uh, hemostasis. A clinical case, a female patient treated for her oncological disease with radiotherapy. She was referred uh, by the ambulance with signs of acute GI bleeding. X-ray revealed a false aneurysm of the left gastric artery. It was selectively catheterized and embolized with microspiral and embospheres, using embospheres, embolospheres. Another case, a patient with chronic pancreatitis developed a false aneurysm of the splenic uh, artery. On a celiacography, 
there were no signs of extravasation of the radiopharmaceutical, but when the splenic artery was catheterized, we found an extravasation of the radiopharmaceutical in the gastric cavity with abrupt worsening of the patient's condition an urgent embolization of the splenic artery had to be performed right away. The patient was discharged with positive results. A patient with, a patient with a peptic ulcer of the gaster and the duodenum, we attempted to try the endovascular hemostasis. She was referred to our center from another hospital with the signs of continuing bleeding. On geography, we see implanted, implanted angiographic clips, and selective angiography revealed a precipitation of the mucosa and uh, ulcerative defect of the duodenum. Uh, embolization was performed, and the patient uh, discharged with positive results. Another patient I wanted to present to you a patient with signs of bleeding that started in another hospital. The surgical correction failed. The CT scan demonstrated a false aneurysm uh, from the branch of superior mesenteric artery with a contrast entering the duodenal cavity. A diagnostic uh, angiography was done. False aneurysm, aneurysmatic cavity was found an afferent branch from the superior, from the SMA, uh, was uh, detected. Selectively, it was catheterized and embolized with microspirals and uh, microspheres. The complications of X-ray intervascular interventions are presented on this slide. After improving of the armory and the methods, the complication rate has been decreased. All these adverse events and complications can be uh, remediated conservatively. In 17% of cases, there were ischemic changes of the mucosa. Another complication is a failure of embolization and uh, um, injection-related uh, or site injection complications are seen in 1% of cases. In Moscow, we see a growing number of endovascular interventions, and in 2018, the number was nearly doubled. It was due to revision of the tariffs for, for these kind of interventions, and to achieve the best results, a multidisciplinary approach is required, involving gastroenterologist X-ray, a specialist anesthesiologists. Uh, Transcatheter embolization is a minimally invasive, safe, and a rapid methods of uh, chemostasis uh, for patients with upper GI bleedings that uh, enables good long-term results and a lower number of um, complications. New instrumental methods uh, for hemostasis uh, have become a golden standard uh, for um, hemostasis of uh, GI bleedings, especially in elderly and comorbid patients. Uh, thank you very much. Are there any questions? So, thank you very much again. We are. What? Yeah, sure. It's off the mic. Please ask the speaker to use the mic. I was surprised to see uh, still more surgery being done for uh, non variceal bleedings uh, in Moscow than radiological intervention. Uh, in my home university, it has reversed completely. We have, uh, I was brought up as an endoscopist learning that you have one try as an endoscopist, you may have two tries as an endoscopist. If you don't make it, it's a surgical case and the surgeon has to fix it. Uh, now that has changed completely. We have like nine times more um, interventional radiological coilings for these uh, non variceal bleedings compared to surgery. It's becoming exceedingly rare that the surgeon has to solve the problem. 
is that a matter of training or is that a matter of culture or is, a, is that a matter of interdisciplinary protocols? Um, that's my question. Or, or the matter of facilities that are... Or matter of yeah. facilities, yes. So also in my country, the surgeons uh, take care maybe for 2% or something of the all patients with apogea bleeding, especially posterior wall of the bulb, duodenal bulb, or maybe lesser curvature of, of the corpus, but uh, otherwise not. So thank you for, for that comment. And uh, we shall proceed with, uh, with uh, two cases. First uh, case will be presented by Dr. Israelov, patient with advanced gastric cancer. Oh, Dr. Semenov, excuse yeah. me. <laughs> okay. It's me again. <laughs> Can I ask for a bit of Okay. Dear Chairman, dear colleagues, thank you very much again uh, for your attention. Uh, so uh, today we would like to present an interesting clinical case about uh, locally advanced gastric cancer treatment in a patient with complicated liver cirrhosis. Why it may be interesting for you? Uh, first of all, we know that uh, there is enough uh, evident data about uh, gastric cancer treatment as well as for the liver disease, uh, but uh, usually patients with cancer are being excluded from uh, liver uh, clinical studies as well as uh, liver cirrhosis, uh, especially advanced, uh, is exclusion criteria for the cancer studies. That's why we don't have evident uh, data and guidelines for the treatment of these uh, combined uh, and severe diseases, and uh, that's why it may be uh, interesting to discuss. So the patient we have is, uh, is uh, 68 years old female. Uh, in uh, 2004, she had uh, HCV infection identified. Uh, then in 2009, liver cirrhosis, uh, again type 3A, class B, child uh, PU and MELT8 with portal hypertension was identified. So she also had uh, ascites and uh, esophageal viruses. In 2009 and uh, 2017, she had two episodes of uh, varicell bleeding, very severe with the endoscopic ligation, uh, but um, and during the uh, control examination, uh, we found that also uh, varicell uh, uh, esophageal viruses and uh, gastric cancer, uh, poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma. So uh, the patient uh, was uh, discussed on our uh, concilium. Here you can see the enlargement of uh, esophageal viruses. And uh, so we consider this fact as a high risk of uh, varicell bleeding in the postoperative period. Speaking about uh, the problems of uh, decision making, uh, we should uh, consider first of all uh, the circumstances from the liver side. Uh, this is a contraindication for liver transplantation in cause of malignant tumor. Also, uh, the patient had repeated varicell bleedings and the uh, inefficiency of endoscopic uh, treatment. Uh, also, the patient has a risk of hepatic failure and uh, portal hypertension uh, progression without treatment. From the other side, we have gastric cancer uh, with its limitation of systemic uh, chemotherapy for gastric cancer due to high risk of uh, the hepatic failure. Also, the patient has increased risk of varicell bleeding in postoperative period because we uh, thought about the distal gastrectomy with the uh, risk of bleeding from the uh, stomach. And uh, the patient has also the oncological risks because uh, locally advanced gastric cancer can uh, give progression without treatment. And uh, so this uh, decision making was really difficult. Further, I would like to discuss uh, the special sides of uh, our thoughts and uh, what we did. So first of all, uh, if we consider gastric cancer of this stage uh, uh, only, uh, we can say that uh, five years survival uh, in case of uh, 1B stage, uh, and if we perform D2 lymphadenectomy, is more than 90%, so that's worth it. Uh, then uh, we can uh, go on uh, to the special uh, clinical uh, study. This is very interesting that uh, some um, uh, clinical uh, specialists compared uh, class A and class B uh, cirrhosis uh, from the side of uh, different uh, volumes of lymphadenectomy for gastric cancer. As you can see here, the uh, grade of uh, complications uh, after D2 lymphadenectomy is much higher in the group of uh, class B uh, liver cirrhosis, and the uh, mortality is uh, really very different. So it's more than 40% for class B uh, cirrhosis and uh, less than uh, seven for class A. Uh, that uh, made us uh, prepare the patient very good because uh, at the start of the treatment, uh, she had uh, class B 
liver cirrhosis. And then we uh, performed uh, the preparation in the hepatic department of our institution and uh, uh, converted it to class A to give uh, more um, possibilities to uh, have better postoperative period. Uh, then you can see here that uh, before the surgery we had uh, very good for the possible uh, level of this patient uh, <coughs> blood tests, uh, so no uh, severe anemia, uh, no signs of uh, problems with uh, coagulation, and uh, also good uh, biochemical status. Uh, proceeding to the other strategy aspects, we can uh, say that uh, the liver uh, disease that needs uh, transplantation has uh, several limitations from the side of malignant tumor. And uh, in the world uh, guidelines, we can see that uh, the five-year remission is uh, mandatory. And uh, speaking about our reality in Russia, I think that this patient uh, will never be able to receive any uh, transplantation. So we needed to think also about uh, liver function after the surgery. Uh, and uh, considering the reason of this cirrhosis, it's uh, HCV infection, uh, we also uh, concluded uh, that uh, guidelines that exist now also recommend to start the uh, special antiviral treatment after radical treatment of cancer. Uh, and uh, it's better to do it uh, uh, half a year or later after the radical surgery for the tumor. So, uh, speaking about the ways of portal hypertension management, uh, of course, uh, endoscopic uh, procedures uh, is the uh, first point, but uh, regarding to the anamnesis of patient and the uh, inefficiency of endoscopic ligation, we didn't uh, take this uh, variant uh, to do. Also, we thought about uh, TIPS, uh, and uh, this is a really good variant maybe for the patient, but uh, it's usually uh, used in our country when we think about bridge therapy and prepare the patient for liver transplant and uh, this is not our case. Uh, also, we know that uh, thrombosis and shunt occlusion are most common complications that uh, also limit our activity. So uh, we have some data about uh, not increasing expected survival in patients with liver cirrhosis and also a higher risk of uh, encephalopathy. Another way to uh, fix the uh, portal hypertension is a splenorenal venous shunt surgical procedure that has uh, less uh, complications rate uh, com uh, comparing with the TIPS. So uh, less occlusion, less uh, bleeding recurrence, and uh, less risk of encephalopathy. Uh, that's why we didn't think about TIPS, and we chose the strategy of surgical venous shunt especially because uh, this uh, region of surgery uh, doesn't uh, enlarge very much the procedure because we needed to work on the stomach to perform distal gastrectomy and uh, the way to the splenic vein and the renal vein is not so far uh, considering our volume of uh, oncological procedure. So we choose the distal uh, splenorenal venous shunt. The indications of these uh, procedures uh, are, of course, high risk of erythral bleeding that we have in the patient and efficiency of endoscopic methods uh, previously uh, used uh, to help the patient and uh, class AB liver cirrhosis, so uh, this uh, fits uh, enough uh, to our case. Uh, the surgical strategy was chosen uh, to be laparoscopic distal gastrectomy with the two lymphadenectomy and laparoscopic distal spinal venous shunt. So let me uh, show you the video of this surgical procedure. Uh, this is already uh, the mobilization of um, renal vein. So we uh, needed to fix it with this band to make it easier. Here you see the pancreas. After that we crossed the vein. We used uh, temporary vessel clips to stop the supply to make it more convenient. Then we crossed the vessels. Here you can see that we prepare uh, the splenic vein for the uh, anastomosis. Then we stop the blood supply. Prepare the wall of renal vein. Then we suture the posterior wall of the anastomosis to connect them. And 
We use continuous suturing. Then we cover the anterior wall of the anastomosis. The most interesting moment when we open the clips and we see the hermetism of the anastomosis, so it's sufficient. Open the blood supply from the splenic vein. Check the hemostasis. So it's okay. Then we finish uh, the reconstruction after distal gastrectomy. You can see the liver that is really cirrhotic changed. And then now a, a classic uh, laparoscopic anastomosis between the stomach and the intestine that we perform with the linear stapler and cover uh, with the standard way. Uh, then uh, we uh, performed a CT scan on the uh, day six. Can you press the video, please, here? So uh, we can see that uh, there are no signs of thrombosis uh, of our um, venous anastomosis here, you will see in the moment, here with the yellow points. So the anastomosis works good. And also uh, here you can see the reconstruction. So splenic vein, uh, renal vein, and the uh, vena cava inferior. Uh, speaking about the postoperative period, that is very important uh, when we uh, are speaking about the minimally invasive approach. Uh, so on the first day after surgery, we started physical activity and uh, we gave uh, 200 milliliters of water. Uh, on day two, uh, we discharged the patient from intensive care unit. Uh, day four, we removed the drain and uh, started liquid feeding. And day five, uh, crushed food with liquid feeding too. And the uh, discharge from the hospital was performed on day eight after this surgery. Uh, that is very important to mention that uh, we had no signs of encephalopathy, no acetolytic syndrome, no varicell bleeding that we were afraid of in postoperative period. So uh, uh, we can think that uh, in uh, earlier stage it's uh, some kind of success. And then uh, the more important point is uh, next steps. Uh, so uh, the patient received full course of antiviral therapy. Uh, from April to November 2017. And then we started systemic chemotherapy considering the results of pathology, but it was interrupted in cause of uh, severe hematologic toxicity in the patient. That's a very important point. Uh, speaking about the control examination in the year after surgery, uh, we had the reconvalent sense of HCV infection, no bleeding recurrence, no cirrhosis progression, regression of portal hypertension and uh, viruses, no signs of ascites. And uh, the important fact is that we suspected an ovarian tumor without exact signs of metastatic disease. But um, it seemed to be uh, something else, uh, but uh, seeing that we have really locally advanced uh, cancer, of course, uh, it's uh, a high risk of a possible progression of uh, gastric cancer. That's why we performed uh, laparoscopy <coughs> in the patient. We performed uh, a frozen section and uh, found uh, the tumor of ovarium. And after uh, that, we performed uh, surgery in the volume of uh, hysterectomy. And uh, immunogistochemistry showed that it was not a metastatic disease, but it was a sertoliolytic cell tumor grade two. Uh, here you can see the pathology of these uh, changes. So special uh, points like leg dick cells, uh, tubular components. So it was a sex cord uh, tumor, certainly leg uh, type, uh, mo uh, moderate differentiated. Also, we compared the immunogistochemistry between the uh, specimen from the stomach and uh, from this uh, ovarial tumor, and it showed different uh, result of uh, cytokeratin uh, to, uh, to, uh, 20 uh, reaction. Uh, so uh, we continued follow-up, and uh, after 20 months after surgery, we didn't see, uh, again, uh, no cirrhosis progression, regression of portal hypertension, ascites of viruses, no encephalopathy, and good uh, quality of life.
Uh, we also uh, found uh, continuous HCV reconvalescence in the patient, no signs of progression of uh, gastric cancer or any other uh, problems on CT scan. Uh, but uh, we uh, had also persistent anemia and thrombocytopenia that uh, didn't uh, give us opportunity to uh, continue systemic chemotherapy for gastric cancer. Uh, for that reason, we sent the patient to our department of hematology, performed bone marrow biopsy, but uh, we didn't find any signs of myelocarcinosis or immune thrombocytopenia. So this uh, in, uh, situation was considered uh, like secondary hemopoietic dysplasia with background uh, of cirrhosis, previously treated paranoplastic syndrome and hepatitis C, because we didn't uh, find any other reasons for this uh, situation in this uh, patient. Uh, so speaking about potential advantages of uh, chosen strategy, we can say that radical tumor and lymph nodes removal uh, really determines survival and distant outcomes in this group of patients in cause of limitations of systemic chemotherapy. Also taking into account the limitations of liver transplantation uh, in cause of malignant disease, Surgical spleno-renal shunt gives survival benefits by compensating portal hypertension, by reducing the risk of varicell bleeding, recurrence, and uh, encephalopathy. And also, a uh, very important fact is minimally invasive approach because uh, it can give us less blood loss. That is very important in this group of patients. Also, we save the venous shunts uh, of uh, the abdominal wall, avoiding uh, laparotomy. And we can uh, early activate uh, the patient and discharge in post-operative period. So to conclude, uh, we can say that surgical splenoral venous shunt with distal or total gastrectomy may be potentially combined to treat a patient with gastric cancer and liver cirrhosis in selected patients because no clinical practice guidelines uh, exist at the moment. Minimal invasive approach is preferable in this group of patients, as I said previously, but we need further follow-up uh, to evaluate distant outcomes of the treatment and possible pros and cons of our strategy. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Uh, excellent uh, talk. Excellent also surgical technique. I'm not a surgeon, but it was very clean operation, at least the video you showed us. So congratulations for that. Any questions? What was the histological type of the cancer? Was it intestinal type or diffuse? It was a uh, diffuse type, and it was poorly differentiated at carcinoma. Why did you uh, decide to uh, perform total gastrectomy? We consider the uh, localization of the uh, primal tumor and the uh, level of infiltration because we know now that uh, the possibility to uh, perform uh, good uh, hemotherapy is uh, also based uh, on the uh, volume of operation. So if we can save part of the stomach, it's better for the patient. Okay. Which type of chemotherapy do you use? Flot? Uh, we, uh, now we have a uh, uh, prospective protocol where we compare flot against Xelox, okay. so the eastern and western approach. Mm -hmm. uh, but this patient uh, went to Xelox. Okay. Thank you very much again. Excellent talk. <laughs> and the last case report, Marcis, you will present. Patient with advanced gastric yep. cancer. Congratulations with the previous presentation, and I will try to, to add something from, from our clinic. Actually, I think I'm going then to continue in English. Uh, and uh, actually, in, in Latvia, it is not gastroenterologists, but medical oncologists that are, that are taking care of the cancer patients of the medical oncology field, unlike some countries like Germany. And uh, this is a reason why I have got also the support from our PhD student and medical oncologist, Dr. Gashenko. This is uh, initially medically managed uh, case by her, 52 years old, Caucasian male. And <clears throat> initially he was presented to the general practitioner, uh, practitioner with fatigue, discomfort, the up the, uh, upper abdomen and weight loss, in particular during the last six months. Although the person was still overweight, but he has lost 10 uh, kilos within the last half of the year. Previously, he has been smoking, not an excessive alcohol drinker. No family history of uh, gastric or other cancers reported. And not significant medical history, including just hypertension. <clears throat> The blood count uh, was very mild anemia without any other um, uh, uh, changes in the clinical chemistry. In the upper endoscopy, there was an infiltration in the gastric uh, wall in the side of lesser curvature, body antrum and pyloric uh, region. 
and <clears throat> with with some uh, some luminal narrowing. So histologically, it was uh, moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma, and with no signs of dissemination within other investigations. So distal subtotal gastrectomy has been performed with D2 lymph uh, adenectomy. And <clears throat> post-operatively, uh, the histology has uh, confirmed uh, the diagnosis uh, with the uh, intestinal type according to Lauren Borman 3. So it was some uh, lymphovascular invasion and the tumor was penetrating serosa. Uh, 3 of 14 altogether regional lymph nodes were positive. And according, according to these findings, uh, it was staged as uh, T4A or, or with clinical signs of, uh, with, with a clinical staging of uh, 3B. Uh, adenocarcinoma. Uh, when looking at the statistics, and sorry, this is a very, very uh, small shift to, to really read, but uh, we all know that uh, this stage of the cancer is not linked to very good survival with uh, less than 10% uh, uh, five-year survival. And let's look how it was with the current case. Currently, the guidelines are rec recommending neoadjuvant and adjuvant chemotherapy, but this was back in 2012, and actually neoadjuvant was not too popular in Latvia. Oh, sorry. And, uh, but the patient was receiving adjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, with uh, uh, doxetaxel and cisplatin for four cycles. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, there was no signs for, for metastatic disease. So the patient was followed up with CT and endoscopy on regular occasions. And I will just uh, want to remind that we do have also the guidelines for uh, follow-up after um, gastrectomy. But I should say that I think either probably as far as I know in the specialized centers here in Russia or also in Latvia, this surveillance has been already conducted even without these guidelines and recommendations and maybe it's more even intensive and longer than, than this consensus report is recommended. So what has happened further on? So two years later, in the end of 2014, uh, the patient got the uh, symptoms of an ileus. First, it has been managed conservatively, medically, and then later in December, a second episode uh, happened. It was impossible to manage this uh, medically, so surgery was performed with partial resection of the small intestine, enteroenteroanastomosis, anastomosis, and uh, it was found uh, that uh, potential metastasis uh, in the colon were present in the subhepatic uh, region. So this was managed endoscopically and, uh, uh, sorry, surgically, uh, and the surgery histology indicated that this had been a metastatic disease of adenosis carcinoma and those was uh, had to negative disease. Uh, the patient has received the next uh, cycles of uh, chemotherapy with Tegafur, that is a pre-drug of 5-FU, with uh, follow-up uh, with the CT and endosc uh, endoscopically. Uh, and uh, Another two years later, an acute episode appeared. It appeared to be an acute cholecystitis, and uh, cholecystectomy was performed. No uh, cancer disease was uh, revealed during this, uh, this stage. However, a year later, in the beginning of 2017, uh, lymph node metastases were identified. 
And uh, the patient once more was getting uh, chemotherapy uh, with uh, doxitaxel, cisplatin, and 5-FU, but it was no effect on this therapy. The disease was progressing. Another chemotherapy with EUX, uh, it is uh, epirubicin, oxyplatin, and 5-FU. And actually, it was a, a positive dynamics uh, for this uh, therapy. Since since the patient was doing better on the chemotherapy, uh, repeated uh, surgery has been performed uh, with um, uh, total gastrectomy for the, for the left uh, part of the stomach, uh, resection of uh, uh, pancreas, and resection of transfer colon, as well as splenectomy, and partly resection of the small intestine. Uh, out of the 15 lymph nodes, one, one had micrometastasis, uh, and it was definitely confirmed that it was a relapse of the disease. But there were complications following the surgery. Another uh, uh, surgery has been performed. So further on, the patient was receiving two other cycles of EUX, and uh, there was another uh, hospitalization due to acute pain, and it appeared that it has been a perforation in the region of the anastomosis. Uh, this was settled surgically, and then the patient was receiving another two cycles of chemotherapy. Uh, the results were good, and actually no residual disease was found uh, during the follow-up investigations, and that is a case uh, also for the time uh, right now. So this is to sum up everything that has happened, starting from the June of 2012 and ending to with the with the last few chemotherapy cycles um, during the end of the last last year. So I was showing the overall expectations on the five-year survival uh, for this stage of cancer. This patient has survived for uh, six, six and a half years so far. The question is what to deal further, and there might be other regimens that could be applied in the case. Uh, Epstein-Barr virus infection has been uh, mentioned for a couple of times today, and actually not because of clinical reasons, but for research reasons, this ha patient happened to have determined the EBV status uh, in a collaborative project with NCI that we do had, but this patient was EBV negative. So this Let's see what will be the future, but at least so far, I believe it's really quite good achievements for the medical oncologists. Thanks. Yeah, I agree completely with you. Very nice presentation. In spite of four operations, very lucky patient up till now. Any questions? Я хотел спросить, используете ли вы в своей практике? I wanted to ask you if you use additional methods of examination prior to your surgery, for example, PET CT. И да да. Usually not, routinely not, and PET CT was not even available in Latvia up to now. Uh, so this method is now available, but uh, routinely we cannot use it still. Uh, because of this shortage of time, I think uh, Professor Bordin will continue immediately with the pancreatic uh, session.